Well, greetings from Michigan State University, where it's a balmy 17 degrees, and welcome to EAB University's 2017 Spring Webinar Series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. This is Robin Osborne, <clears throat> and I'm coming to you today to, to welcome you to the EAB University webinar, and along with my colleagues, Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University and Amy Stone from The Ohio State University, we welcome you to today's webinar, Utilizing Community tree, Street Tree Surveys in an Early Detection Rapid Response Program, presented by Tivon Feely, the Forest Health Program Leader for the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. Tivon holds a bachelor's degree in forestry with an emphasis in forestry management and a minor in advanced genetics from Ohio, from the Iowa State University and a master's in forestry with an emphasis in forest pest management from Iowa State as well. After completing his bachelor's, T. Vaughn had an internship as City Forester in Central Park West, New York, New York. He then worked as a diagnostician in the plant disease clinic with the Department of Plant Pathology at ISU and then worked as a forestry extension specialist for eight years. In 2008, Tivone joined the Iowa Department of Natural Resources as a forest health program leader. At the IDNR, he works with both native and exotic tree pests with his time primarily spent on our friend Emerald Ashbor as well as thousand cankers disease, Asian longhorn beetle, gypsy moth, Burr oak blight, oak, blight, oak wilt, and invasive plants. Before we get started, please know that we welcome your comments and questions, so please feel free to type them in the chat feature, which you can find by mousing over the bottom or occasionally the top of your screen. We will make a note of all questions and we'll have Tivone respond to them when his presentation is finished. To keep these free webinars coming, we need your feedback. After the webinar, I will be mailing a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that I hope you'll take the time to fill out. And you will be getting an EAB goodie bag if you're one of the first 10 people to fill out the survey. For those of you wanting CEUs, if you would like a certificate indicating that you participated in today's live webinar, complete the survey and send an email message to Amy Stone at stone.91 at osu.edu. I will also be putting these instructions in the email I send to you, and Amy will be sending out the certificates within a week of today's program. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing soon at www.emeraldashborer.info. You will also find the recordings for all previous EAB University webinars there. Thank you for attending today. And Tivone, please share your screen with your presentation and we will get started. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you, Robin. As Robin said, I am uh, Tivone Feely and I'm the Forest Health Program Leader for the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. And today we're gonna talk a little bit about how we developed community tree inventories and how we use that not only for emerald ash borer, but for other pests that we want to monitor in the state of Iowa. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of the background history, a little bit of the training that we use actually in the field um, for the people that do the, the data collection for us. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then we'll get into the real heart of it um, and we'll look at some of the, the stuff online, uh, the management plans themselves that we develop, and then um, the ARC map where you can actually see the data live and you can download some of this stuff. So let's take a look at the very first slide and get started. If I can get it to advance here. There you go. All right, so it started out with a question and we wanted to know where emerald ash borer was in the state of Iowa. And of course, if you've done this in the past, you know the Sentinel tree program, if you've done that, is very expensive. You know, you double girdle the tree, you've got to go out and bark peel it. It's very laborious, takes a lot of try time. And you know, and we, we looked at some of our risk sites when we modeled the state of Iowa, we were running out of ash trees that were available to use, especially along the rest areas and rest stops. 
And the purple traps, we were finding we just couldn't maintain an effective grid. We either didn't have trees there, a lot of cropland in the state of Iowa. Um, and we didn't have a lot of great success overall. In fact, our success in purple traps has really been um, on trees that we had suspected were already infect, infested with uh, emerald ash borer. So the big problem, as we all know, is emerald ash borer has this lack of pheromone. So we're looking for the needle in the haystack. So we kind of sat back and debated. And at that time, the, the urban forester that I worked with uh, in the DNR was Randy Cook. And he said, there's got to be a better, better way to start searching for emerald ash borer. And so we came up with this idea of this community assistance. And we wrote a grant to the U.S. Forest Service. And at that time, they were called CARP grants. Now they're known as LSR grants, but these are grants that states can write, competitive grants. And we were awarded the grant. And, and this particular grant looked at 200 communities. And I got to tell you right now, that was a bit, a bit much, a bit more than we probably should have taken on. But we looked at 200 underserved communities. And we decided that underserved is probably communities that had 5,000 households or under. And we're going to look at public trees only. And as part of this grant, we were going to complete a street tree inventory. And some of these communities decided, you know what, we went, especially the smaller ones, we went more than just street trees. We went parks, we went cemeteries. So if we could accommodate, we would. And that would allow us to provide them an emerald ash borer management plan. And I'll show you a little bit later at the end of the presentation what that management plan would look like. And everybody received those. And that management plan would look at their current budget and show them in real time how long is it going to take to remove all of the ash trees in the community, given your current budget? And how much should you probably be funding your, your ash removal program? Luckily for us, the grant was rewarded. And this was kind of the opportunity of a lifetime for us because we got our data collectors out there. I'm the one forest health specialist in the state. I sat back and looked at this and said, not only can I use this for the emerald ash borer, monitoring that we do and as Robin alluded to there's so many other pests that they monitor as the one forest health per person in the state from invasive plants to oak wilt to bore oak blight to you know walnut twig beetle and thousand caker disease we can collect all kinds of data so I'm going to give you a little bit of a example of what we started to do here all right so this is kind of the training video that we would show everybody and we use our our, our district foresters which are our field foresters. Um, later, we started going out and training community volunteers to help do this as well in their own community. Um, this is a Juno unit. This is our GPS unit, and on there is ArcMap Mobile. So you can just get an idea what it looks like. So they're gonna tap to open that. Like I said, you're gonna see the training video of it just a little bit. Then they're gonna get in there and get ready to collect. So they're gonna get the location turned on, wait until they get their GPS fix, and it's going to show where they're at. Here it's showing Polk County, which is where Des Moines is. Well, my cursor show up here again. Then they can zoom into the area that they want to start working. So these are smaller communities. They can say, I want to start collecting in this part of the streets. This is the benefit. They can say, I want to start in the northwest part of town, take a break, come back in a few days, and keep collecting until all the streets have been um, surveyed. Um, then they're going to have to start collecting all the features. You have to turn on the data collection feature and turn on all the attributes. And I'll show you what some of those are in just a second. My mouse keeps disappearing here in one second. There we go. And for most of ours, it's city managed um, areas. You might put in their park managed areas. We have a few other uh, units out in the field where it's actually a state forest or a park managed. So you can set your parameters to whatever you need here. So they'd get out in the field, they'd get their GPS location, they'd get up next to a tree and they would tap the species. Is it a basswood? Is it an ash tree? Which type of ash? Okay. Then after they figured out what type of tree, so let's say they said it was a green ash tree, we wanted to know a little bit more about it. Where is this tree planted? What's the land use? Is it a commercial? Is it a single family residence? You know, that gathers a little bit of information because if the tree's in some sort of decline, there might be other factors at play. So this kind of helped us with that. Then I want to also know about the planting because if it's a cutout 
or you have this concrete island, well, for a lot of other things that we're looking at, that also will give me a lot of information. But if we have a nice wide planting boulevard, um, lots of lots of area between the curb and sidewalk, or a nice front yard area, then I'm I'm not so worried about it. I mean, there's probably something else going on if I see something flagged in the system. And I'll show you what that'll mean as we keep going. So we're just collecting information here. And then I also want to know the diameter. That's uh, grateful, great, greatly helpful as we get going into this. So the diameter at breast height, TBH. And then for the cities, we were interested in what they wanted to know. And of course, they're in a, a maintenance schedule. So they wanted to know, does the tree need to be pruned? If it's a young tree, does it need just you know some regular pruning to get out the, the double leaders? Do I need to go through and find a mature tree that just needs routine maintenance, or I need to lift the, the tree on the roadside and maintain clearance, or do I have a critical concern where I have a, an extreme risk tree where it might break and fail and, and be uh, a hazard to the public? And then we would assign a priority task to that. So the higher the priority task, the quicker they should go look at that tree. So it went from none to you know, just basically reducing the crown, to removal immediately because the tree is dangerous, to something that I find a little bit more interesting in my world where eh, it looks like the tree has a, a disease or a pest on it. And they could select, is it an insect or pathogen? Something's going on with that tree. Then the sidewalk, is there sidewalk present? You know, if, it's, if the tree's heaving, you know, those things can indicate decay. So we collect that information as well. Are there power lines? This also helps us decide if it's a plantable site or not, you know, if they're going to come back and replant in that area. If so if it's going to be for a larger shade tree or something smaller. And the wood condition, you know, and this is kind of a judgment call here. Is the, is the wood dead and dying where you have a lot of extreme problems or is it poor um, where you have, you know, major problems or is it fair, you might have a few dead branches or is it good with new apparent problems? So this is probably the hardest field that we developed. Like I said, it is a judgment call on, on the person surveying and it, it varies a lot on this field. We probably should have made this one a little bit stricter. And the leaf health, in the leaf health, we just, we'd find this a little bit more specifically, dead or dying, um, poor, which meant half of the foliage was gone at the time of the inventory, fair, a third of the foliage was gone or good, there was no apparent problems. Um, but once again, the time of the year that you're doing the inventory and surveying these trees, that makes a difference as well. Then we get into the more specifics or forest health boxes. And as you can see, I want to know if they're bark size kinkers, dime size excess holes, does it look like there's oak wilt, pork blight? And we'll get into these. So you can see that I'm starting to collect more and more specifics right down to specific pests that I'm really trying to search out. So let's say you picked that you had a green ash. The first thing that's gonna pop up are the EAB symptoms. It's gonna ask you a series of questions. It's gonna say on that ash tree, after you put in the diameter, it's gonna say, do you have canopy dieback? And this is something that we would identify and explain in the training before they go out and survey these trees. Do you see epicornic shoots, yes or no? Do you see bark splits? This is not a great example of a bark split, but that's the picture that's in our slide for training right now. Um, and they can answer yes or no on that. Do you see D-shaped exit holes? As we know, as emerald ash borer leaves, it's got the flat back and kind of rounded belly, and so it leaves that nice D-shaped exit hole. And do you see woodpecker flecking or blonding? And for us in the state of Iowa, that's been one of the keys. You know, when you see that flecking or blonding, that's the tree that I'm most interested in. Um, so if I see woodpecker flecking show up on any of these inventories in association with anything else, I'm really curious and I want to go out and see what's going on in that community. If I see multiple trees with woodpecker damage, then I'm, I'm very interested. And that community needs follow-up for early detection of emerald ash borer. Then we get into 1,000 canker disease. And that, you know, kind of begged the question there, well, we're already going out. So if you selected walnut, what question should we ask right there? So as soon as you put in the, any of the juggling species, um, it's going to ask you if you see any of the yellowing leaves, which you can see in the picture here. 
that would be uh, dur during the normal growing season, so a little off. Do you see wilting leaves? So actively wilting leaves and wilting branches. So something that would be more of a common sign with thousand kager disease or attack from walnut twig beetle. Do you see brown leaves that are still attached? And do you see recently dead branches? So something that would indicate that the tree is actively, actively dying. And die back. And then there's a percent scale that they could rate on their, their questions. I'm, mouse keeps disappearing here. Sorry about that if you see a lot of motion here. And then you see these pin exit holes, which would possibly be um, walnut twig beetle, but more likely it's the ambrosia beetles. We have not found walnut twig beetle in Iowa, but we've seen many ambrosia beetles. Um, so this has helped us figure out what trees we should place our walnut twig beetle and Lindgren funnel traps on. So, and I'll show you maps of this here in a little bit. And do you see any of these bark cankers? You know, these dime size or less uh, cankers that supposedly coalesce, although, you know, as I see them out east, they don't really coalesce so much, but um, do you see any of these cankers on, on the walnut? So, then what started into the maples, looking for Asian longhorn beetle. Do you see uh, an exit hole that's nearly dime size? Um, something that you could put a, a number two pencil in easily. And we we put this in for maple. We could include the other, other hosts such as elm, willow, horse chestnut, birch, London plane tree. We, we didn't add all of those in. We just focused on maple for the purpose of our initial survey. And then oak wilt, you see the, the bronze color leaves. Um, the dieback pattern is going to be very important. So it says in the questions, does it start at the tips of the branches and die back? Do you see leaf drop? Is it actively dropping leaves during the year? Are the leaves pliable when they hit the ground? Um, which is going to be the opposite of Baroque blight, which we see a lot in Iowa, where the browning starts at the bottom of the tree, the interior of the tree. Those leaves are not pliable, they're dry. They're going to crumble very quickly. Uh, it shows up in late August, and those leaves will hang on during the wintertime. So the browning starts along the veins and looks quite different than, than oak wilt. So in the training, they can see the difference. And so we can start mapping out where we're finding oak wilt in communities in Baroque blight. So then we get into some of our survey data. And in the state of Iowa, walnut twig beetle is something that we trap for quite heavily. And we put it out for bid. And we use contractors to do all of our trapping. Um, the samples come back into my lab and then we quickly sort kind of a triage work, things that couldn't possibly be um, a pityothrus, a walnut twig beetle, and then everything else that could be an ambrosia type or pityothrus, and then I sort them out. But, you know, where do we place these traps? Well, these surveys allowed us to take all of these trees that had some sort of decline, and you can see all of them there. There's 1,712 black walnut trees that were trapped in 2016. These trees were largely identified through these community inventories. Um, some of these were also found on our state forest lands and parks and so forth, but most of them were through community inventories. And we could take that data and say, okay, we have trees that we know that were declining in some stage, maybe just slightly yellowing. yellowing. Um, nothing that had cankers, nothing that had anything really significant, but let's find out what's going on and let's trap near them. So let's put these up for bid. And we're not just guessing anymore. We're not just randomly putting a uh, trap out there looking for that needle in the haystack. We actually have a data point with something that's maybe suspicious, some more so than others. And so you can see what our walnut twig beetle survey looked like for 2016. And that's quite a lot of traps. Um, but it makes it a lot easier when you know where the data points are, where you know where the walnuts are for the contractors to bid on. Uh, the hard part is looking at all that data and all those beetles when they come back into the lab. Um, Asian longhorn beetle, so we had all that data collected. The state of Iowa gave us $500,000 for a forest health monitoring program, and some of that money was used for Asian longhorn beetle up until the year 2014. So you can see 
same thing. We took 1,418 trees and we put them up for bid and said, okay, we got some trees that have some sort of decline. Nothing that stood out and said, okay, yeah, we have dime size exit holes, but you know, there's something going on and they had two or more symptoms out of that list. Let's, uh, let's put it up for bid. Let's see what happens. In this case, the Davy Resource Group out of Kent, Ohio bid on it. Uh, they came and they looked at each and one, every one of these trees. There was only one tree all the way over here, if you look at my cursor in rest, West Liberty, that actually did have, when they got into it, an exit hole that was close to dime size. That tree was, we removed, we, we uh, destructively sampled, turned out to be carpenter worm. So, you know, I think we're one of the few states that had at least some level of confidence up until 2014 that could say, we're not seeing Asian longhorn beetle. Um, we could show you the maps from 2010, 11, 12, 13, and 14. And you can see how the community has moved around. But we had a, a nice, solid survey going on until the funding went away for this particular part of the survey. So Asian longhorn beetle is not surveyed at this point right now. We're still collecting the data. Um, if we did see dime size exit holes, we could easily follow up on that one. Emerald Ash 4, we're still using it. This is the current Emerald Ash Borer map for the state of Iowa. The red dots are the initial county finds, so the first confirmation in that county. We, we don't put the subsequent finds on the maps. Um, the darker tan that you see is the 15 mile target radius that we put around there for the treatment zone. And they've coalesced, and as we find subsequent finds, you get this kind of odd shape. Now we're kind of debating, and that debate started today you know, the southern two-thirds of Iowa is almost all one big blob, almost one big treatment zone. And then this strange asterisk here, you can see that's our new county find when we do a press release. So overall, did this, the, this method help find emerald ash borer? That's a question I get asked a lot. And the answer is that it didn't really help a lot yet. Um, the surveys themselves didn't provide data that said, hey, we've got trees here that need to be followed up right now. Um, what happened in most cases is we would go out, and I'm trying to remember, I believe in Montgomery County right down here, we'd go out and we'd provide the training, and while we were there doing the training, I would find a tree that was a suspect of emerald ash borer. We'd peel it on site, and lo and behold, we'd find the larva and cement it into the national identifiers, and that was its confirmation. So we'd find them actually more during the training than during the survey itself. So that was just kind of the irony of the situation. But when we find trees that are suspect in the new county that we're following up in, and there's several counties we're looking at, we can go back to trees that had stuff that was maybe a little bit suspicious, had a little bit of woodpecker flecking, give exact street addresses, GPS coordinates, whatever the surveyor wants to know, and they can see, okay, did that woodpecker pecker flecking go from a small amount to a much larger amount, you know? and then they can see, yeah, it's time to peel this tree. And that's where we're at now. So the data is just now begun, kind of turning around and becoming useful again. And we use this also on our state lands for invasive plants, and I'll just show you this for the woodlands, um, real quick for anybody out there that does woodland stuff, so we can keep track of oh, a myriad of state plants. You can see them all down here. You can do this easily to keep track. One that I really, really kind of want to monitor in this world is Orange to Bittersweet. It's one that can quickly get ahead of us. So, But I just want to show you just how quickly you can use this. You can adapt this tool for all kinds of pests if you're out there doing surveys. I know the next slide is going to say questions, but we're going to skip questions for a little bit because I want to bring it up. Because I told you we're going to look at a management plan. So... This is our urban forestry page. I'll take you to the top of it. You can see the web address, web address up here. This will take us to the interactive GIS website, which we'll take a look at here in just a few moments. But if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the play, page, here's the urban forestry management plans. And every community that we sur surveyed in, they have a management plan for Emerald Ash Borer all the way down here. And you can see I'm right now hovering over Anthem. Their management plan was done in 2016, uh, September 16 of 2016 to be precise. And it was uploaded at 2.34 p.m. So we could take a look at this one. 
I've already downloaded this one just to take a quick pre preview. This is a small town in Iowa. So I click on this and bring it over. It shows, this shows the boundaries of the town of Anthem. It shows all the publicly owned trees. And here's just the, the person, Emma Hannigan, our urban forester now. She prepared this management plan. You can see all this stuff in the table. But this section down here is the part that I like about Emerald Ash Borer. And we'll cover some of this in just a moment. So we'll scroll down a little bit so you can see there's a review. Talks about the benefits of trees, but it talks about the breakdown. In this case, they have 39 different tree species that makes up the, the diversity, if you will, of the town of Anthem. But out of those, ash makes up 35%, which is a pretty hefty load. 22% being maple, and then hackberry at 15%. So not a lot of diversity in this town. And you can see everything else that shows up. And so that's one of the benefits of when we do these, these inventories. We can show them what they have. And when they lose their 187 ash trees, if Asian longhorn beetle came in, they don't have a lot of trees left. And so we can paint a, a real-time picture. You know, you're losing this, what's going to happen if you lost this? Don't plant maple next. Try to diversify. So, talks about their management, risk tree management, pruning cycles, planting. We're going to keep scrolling down. Plans for the first six years. But this here is the part I like. So, over six years, if you try to remove your ash trees, all right, it would take approximately 54 years to remove all the ash trees within their current budget. So we take a look at that community, the community of Anthem's budget, and see, given your current ash level, your planting of ash that you have, and your current budget, if you dedicated that all to ash removal, it would take 54 years to get the, the ash out of there. And that's kind of an eye-opening position for community to be in. I don't think they realize, huh, I need a lot more money. So they ask the obvious question, well, what kind of budget do I need? Well, if they want to remove their ash within the next six years, they would need $131,000 a year for the next six years um, to keep that, the budget sustained, which most people are like, no, remove all of those ash trees. And that's one of the benefits of the management plan is it lets, lets the community see that, okay, we, we have options here. We can find some middle ground, but we definitely need to increase what we're spending on ash removal, ash treatment, whatever they decide to do. And so, and you can see the treatment of the ash. We have, an, we have uh, links in there and the quarantines with disposal. We have that all in here. So all of these are online. Should you want to read through one? Um, there's different sizes of communities. So you can go online and see uh, if there's a community in, in your state that's a great match for the size. Then that's one that you could um, maybe mirror off of. Now I have another tab. Unfortunately, it's hidden over here. I'm not sure I'm going to get to it because this is in the way. Let's see if I can figure this out. There we go. All right. So this is that ArcGIS, uh, the Arc map that was online on this community tree inventory site. So all of the data is housed here. So if I want to find something, I want to go to the city of Anthon. We just talked about that. So I can type in Anthon, if I can spell here, Anthon, Iowa, and we'll zoom in. And there's Anthon, Iowa. I'll click this out of the way. Get this out of the way here. And you can see all of the community trees. And you can scroll in. You can click on a tree there find out some information about it, okay? 
You can find certain trees. You can find it by tree ID. You can find it by species, by priority tasks, um, by task in the town, by maintenance. There's a lot of different ways to look at the, the data in here. Now, one of the features that we do not have turned on in here is to search by the pest anymore. Um, we took out the dime size exit holes, the trees that had multiple EAB symptoms, and we took out um, all the walnut twig beetle symptoms um, just to prevent people from showing up at somebody's house and saying, hey, I want to take a look at a heavily blonded tree and see what it looks like. So that was taken out because this is a public site for everybody's privacy. However, we do have that in our GIS lab, so we, I can sort through that and look at it. But this is available to communities. They could search for all the maintenance codes. Um, we could still look at priority tasks. You can click on one. We can still look at pest and disease, execute. This will show us statewide because I didn't put in a town on it yet. It's thinking away here. It's got a tremendous amount of data, and it's going to show you everything that had. There's a Norway maple, uh, a bur oak, and you can click on any of those that, you know, strikes your fancy. Here's a green ash, 30 to 60 inch, you know, and we can click on that and take you right to it. And we can zoom to that tree and see, get this out of the way. Hopefully our resolution clears up here. Apparently the network's a little slow here today, but um, you can zoom to that tree. You can find out a lot more about it. So you can get all of the stuff that was inventoried about it. I can do this just as a quick search. I can get that tree ID. You can see that it has a unique tree ID number. Uh, just from a quick search here, I can send that up to our GIS lab and say, hey, I'm just curious about this tree. What can you tell me about that? For the data that we've collected out in the field um, for Emerald Ash Borer or if it was for boric blight or for any other pest that we have. So as you can imagine, it's become now this large amassed set of data. We seem to be frozen up at the moment on this side. There we go. I will back out of that. But that allows you to search through that. And there's multiple ways to search through that, but unfortunately I froze that one up. Let's see if I can open it up again. Let's give it a second here. We'll pick on Anthony Iowa one more time. All right. Then you have your tools off to the side here. And you can turn on different layers. So you have your tree inventory layers, base map layers, um, your measurement tools. So that gives you a good idea of all the things you can do within the state. Um, let's try this one more time. I, I'm not logged in. Otherwise, we could search a different way. Let's do one more. So we want a priority task. We want a tree pest. And the town name, I don't think Anthon had any. Let's see if there's anything in there. And there's no tree pest that were identified in Anthon. So that query comes up very quickly. So but I can go back, I can take out Anthem, execute it again, and it'll show me everything statewide and I can just search through all the towns. So we can take a look at this Norway Maple in Logan, Iowa. And we'll click this out of the way. We'll zoom to that. And there's all the information that we have on that. 
and they can take pictures in the field if you require it. Um, that's some of the Juno units have that and other GPS units. Um, I know some states are trying to do this as well and they're using tablets out in the field. Um, they work quite well as, as well. So that's really pretty much everything I have. If people have questions, this is a great time to ask them. Okay, um, I do have one, a couple for you. Um, how long did each of those surveys take you? It really depends. Um, when we first started out, the surveys done on the communities that were 5,000 and under, I'll pick on Anthem. Uh, that's a smaller town. We can zoom out on this one so you can see how small it is. This one could easily take a month or two when you first start out. But once you get it down and you get in the flow, um, you could trim that down to three to four weeks and knock out a town like this. Um, when he started contracting, it was, it was actually one of the better deals. Um, our experience has been contractors tend to overbid. And that's good for us, maybe bad for them. So you get a lot of work done. And the hard part is getting the management plans written and out in the field. So we'd have to proofread the management plan, put our seal of approval on it, and they would present those to the communities. So it, I would say in a small community, it could take a good month. You know, we're, in, we're looking at communities now in that five to 10,000. So that could take a couple months to get done. But we're also changing our role a little bit. We're letting the community leaders leaders do that in their tree boards, and we're training them and just providing the equipment to help alleviate the load. And we do have a wait list, um, and it could be a year or two to get some of these community inventories done. Okay. Um, then the next question is, is the mobile ESRI application you're using a precursor to collector or is it a separate entity? Ooh, the collector is a separate entity. That's a great question. Um, so our collector we designed ourselves. At first we thought about using iTree as a data collector itself and then we just realized there's too many parameters and too many species with an iTree that we didn't have in Iowa and we just needed to clean things up and then as we started building it we realized it's it's easier to build our data collect ourselves there's nothing proprietary about it. It's something that we would have no trouble sharing with other states. Uh, you could build on it yourself and add more collection fields. Um, it's just a simple collector that we built with an arc map that could be shared. Um, the, the field parameters are very simple to add in there. So, and then you could add your own species list. You can add your own, um, that, like I said, collection data points that you want. So if there are other pests that you're surveying for, if you're looking for hemlock woolly delgid, if you're looking for other pests, it's it's pretty simple to add in into it. So a great question. And the, the next part we're looking at is, you know, with these AGOLs is our ArcGIS Online. Um, that's kind of the next wave with so many people having that as their account. I'm not sure what that's going to mean. Um, I think it's going to be an easier way to share the data and shape files. Um, so we'll see how that turns out. Okay. Um, Rachel, who has been asking these questions, um, has one other comment. She says, I would be definitely interested in taking a look at what you've designed since it seems much more intuitive than Collector. That's great, Rachel. Hang on a second. Let me get down here. There's my email. <laughs> Rachel, send me an email and I will get you in contact with our GIS lab and they could talk about how everything was designed and um, we can either get you a, the whole test bottle sent out or um, I, I know we can't design it for you, but we can get you what we've got in our platform set up. So. All right. Um, Mark asks, is all mapping and, and database you've shown done through ArcGIS? Everything is done through ArcGIS, correct. We looked at other programs, and the problem that we had is they were all fee-based. And um, 
you know, there's a lot of great companies out there that have a lot of great software, but you have to pay for sites. You have to pay for the data collection, even if it was a plantable site. And the communities didn't have the money for this. We didn't have the money for this. Uh, the grants expire. So what are you going to do with the data after this? Uh, we couldn't keep paying for it. So yeah, Arc, ArcJS was the way, ArcMap was the way to collect it for us. And we just house it there. And right now they're, they're picked up by the state of Iowa as a historical record. Most of the data was collected pre-EAB. Uh, 2010 was our first find in Alameda County, which is way up in northeast Iowa. In fact, I'll bring that map up. That's uh, make it larger so you can see it. That's way up here. And we didn't find anything else until 2013. So we had many years to collect data. So we have a pretty good picture of what the landscape in Iowa looked like pre-emerald ash borer versus what it looks like now after emerald ash borer has gone through most of the state. And the state historian said, hey, you know, this is kind of great. I'd like to keep this data as an historical record because we know what people think and it's kind of a biased view of what the state looked like before Dutch elm disease and then post Dutch elm disease. We really don't know. Uh, here we have actual fact-based data points. We have actual pictures. We have actual, you know, references that we could say, here's what it was before and here's what it looks like afterwards. Words. And we have that um, this way for communities and then we have that with our FIA data through the Forest Service for woodlands. So just another way to use this as a tool. Okay, um, Cliff Sadoff asks, overall, what has been the community response to when they find they have many trees susceptible, oh gosh, susceptible to EAB? Are they eager to act? Do they tend to want to get rid of the ash, treat, or both? It has been a mixed bag, Cliff, and then I wish I could say it was, it was we want to do something now. Um, very few communities have been on the side of let's treat our trees. Um, we've had a couple that have been, okay, let's look at this logically, let's treat a few and start the removal process and the treatments are used as a tool to, to reduce the upfront cost and then they'll start removing those trees that they're treating. Um, most of them have that that sticker shock, you know, they see that price tag and like, wow, we didn't realize we had so many ash trees. We didn't, and especially when you get into Western Iowa, where the species diversity is much less and ash component is a greater percent. They had no idea how many they had. And it, it makes it uh, more difficult for them to realize that, hey, we've got to allocate more money to our budget and we have to manage now because that wave is here and it's, it's coming faster. And so they've been a little bit hesitant. Some communities have opted to do absolutely nothing. They're just taking them down as the trees, you know, die and fall apart. Other communities have been proactive. So it's really been a mixed bag. I can't say that anybody's done the same. Um, the one thing I can say is treatment's been the lowest. Um, most of them have adopted at least an increase, not to the level that I would hope, but at least a slight slight increase to their ash removal budget. So that's been the positive of it. If anything else, and this has been the big thing, it's made them aware of two things. It's made them aware that they have a huge lack of diversity in their communities. That is ash and maple, ash and maple. Those are the top two. And then that there are other pests. Emerald ash borer is not the only one. Asian longhorn beetles out there. Um, like I said, oak wilt, baroque blight, uh, all of these other things that they weren't aware of. And so when they get the full presentation and we talk about diversity, 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 we also provide a list of recommended trees to plant as they remove these ash trees down. They sit there and they scratch their head and they're like, okay, I think it's about time to look at that because it's alarming when they see that ash is at maybe 45% and maple in that case was at 33%. We shouldn't be at that number anymore. So I think that's been the positive out of it. But yeah, it's been a, a really mixed bag in the response that we get.
Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions popping up um, right now, but I wanted to make sure that you all remember that this, this um, webinar is being recorded and we will be having the recorded webinar posted on the emeraldashbore.info website and I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank you Tavone for um, <clears throat> presenting all this good technology kind of thing that really looks like it's it's really helping Iowa I'm just really you know thrilled with all the management plans you have there because that's one of the things that we we keep talking to folks about make sure you know to get a management plan do tree inventories start from there and let's go you know so it's um it's great to see that that this is working and we have now have a great example of this um let's see so now we've got okay um we have a someone that says Great webinar and a useful resource. Thank you very much. Um, and if there's any other questions, make sure you grab Tavone's um, contact information here. And I will also put it on the um, email that I'll be sending out to all of you uh, with the survey. So at this point, I want to say thanks again, Tavone. I want to thank everyone for attending and um, Stay tuned. We've, we're going to have one more next week talking about e, re, EAB rearing um, and what that entails and also rearing the biocontrol parasit, parasitoids that are going after EAB. So come back and visit us next Tuesday for that. And with that, I will say thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone.